You got to hear the story. The reason I'm doing this presentation today, this specifically about this lab test, is because there was a person that was in one of our groups that we have who was there for a month, never asked a question, never showed up for the Zoom sessions. And a month after that said, oh, my doctor told me to stop keto because of this lab. And so I said, okay, uh, this wasn't even a conversation. I said, what was the lab? And that's the story. So this is the lab why most doctors will tell you to stop keto is because of this. And it's a misunderstanding if you ask me, but we'll go in deep, very deep, okay? Because of this lab. What is that lab? This lab is called the anion gap, and it's a measurement of your electrolytes. Most doctors don't know why it's important, or worse, as in this case, they misinterpret it. So here's what you need to know. What are your electrolytes? We hear so much about electrolytes. What does it cost? And most importantly, why you should do this for yourself. Why you should do this for yourself. You need to participate in your own health. This is my platform here, so to say. Okay, the anion gap, AG. The anion gap is a measure of acid-base balance. When people say, oh, your blood's too acid or it's too alkaline. This is what they're talking about. It's a bit misconstrued and we need to get to know what exactly we're talking about. So we're gonna look at a formula, which is the anion gap, AG, which is sodium, an electrolyte, minus chloride and CO2 or bicarb. Okay, so what does it cost? Under $5. You have to pay for a phlebotomy fee if you go to LabCorp or Quest. Here's a link for those people who like to use it through me. We don't get a penny. Really don't get a penny on this. This is Ulta Labs that uses Quest for their labs, but this is it. So these are the four you're gonna get. Boom, your electrolytes. Let me tell you a little more about it though. Okay, so where to get this done, you go to that site and then you plug in your address of course and if you're rural you'll probably have to drive a half hour to who knows maybe even an hour if you're a little more urban or suburban it's probably five minutes away and there's probably 10 uh, phlebotomy places around and this is through the quest as i say through ulta labs so there's two methods to calculate the anion gap one is what's called the simple calculation sodium minus minus chloride and bicarb or CO2, which is what I just mentioned. This is what we'll focus on today. The other is what they call the conventional calculation, which is hardly ever used. I don't know why they call it conventional. And it's basically sodium and potassium, two cations minus chloride and, and CO2 or bicarb. We'll compare them both in the end, but we're only gonna be really talking about one. So where do you find this in your labs? If you go to your doctor on a regular basis each year, they probably take a panel and you're it's a very standard panel. So in the comp panel, there is a part that is called an electrolyte panel, okay? And so that's what we're looking at. So this is for you who are already getting your labs from your doctor and saying, where do I find this stuff we're gonna talk about today? Well, here it is. So it's sodium, potassium, chloride, and carbon dioxide. We're not gonna use the potassium part. That is part of your panel. Remember, that's the conventional. We're not gonna use the conventional one. I'll show you in the end. So that's what we're looking at. So here's the process we're gonna go through. So when I get my data, this is how it is. We start with people. So in your case, we're starting with you. You get your raw data, whatever that is. You get your labs. And then what I do, I take everybody's labs, not yours. I mean, the people who I work with, I take everybody's labs and I put them in a collective spreadsheet. And that's what you see in behind. So from the spreadsheet, that allows me to do scatter plots, which allows me to get much more detail in terms of comparing different things, age versus a lab test, two different lab tests to each other. It's, it's phenomenal and it's very helpful for me to be able to help other people way more than I thought it would be. So here's just a, a quick flash of a portion of the spreadsheet that has, here's the electrolytes. I called them out. There's sodium, potassium, chloride, carbon dioxide, and calcium. We're not going to use the calcium. We're not going to use the potassium, but basically I just calculated. So this is a long list of people, a little screenshot, so it's obviously a lot longer, of the anion gap, the simple method. There's the conventional, and we'll go down, we'll compare these, and then there's even sodium potassium. We'll talk about that later in another video, but all of this you get for five dollars, <laughs> and we're going to really pull out a lot of value for these five dollars of a lab test, so I hope you do it. So we're going to end up back here looking at this spreadsheet to make some comparisons, but first you need to know what this lab actually is and if it's relevant to your situation. So an example, Anion gap, the sodium minus the chloride and the bicarb, or the CO2. Here's that portion, right? We, we're not looking at the potassium. We have these three here. We're taking these numbers, and I'm just making it simple down here. These are the numbers up here. Three numbers here. We're subtracting these two from this one. This is pretty easy math. So 144 minus the 103 and 24 equals 17. So in this person's, man 66, an actual person, he has a bicarb of 17. What does that mean? Who cares? Well, that's what we're going to find out. 
if you want to not calculate it yourself for those three things that you have to calculate, you actually can go online and here's a link and you can throw in your numbers here. And if you're in Europe, you can change the units. And so it's all very international and you get to find out what your anion gap actually is and you can track it through your lifetime. And I think you should do it. So when did the ion, anion gap become commonly used? So I go back to med school when I was in med school in the 90s. Yeah, we, we studied it, but it's never been mentioned. There's not one conversations I've had with any patient or any doctor or any consult for anybody else. It never came up. So when it came up with this guy, I go, oh, that's interesting. I should probably go back and really look at this and see how relevant it is. I sort of had a, an answer that it wasn't relevant, and I still stick with that it wasn't relevant. But I needed to go a little deeper for myself if nobody else. So what are we measuring? So this is how it is. In your blood, we have cations and we have anions, pretty straightforward, and they equal each other out, right? So if you add up all of these and add up, all, subtract all of these, you're gonna get to zero and you're always gonna get to zero. So that's kind of a, an electric zero. It's always neutral. There's never a positive or a negative. But however, for the, this anion gap, it's really a back of the napkin uh, calculation that is fast and furious, very simple, pieces are missing, but it's meant to be a triage lab for people going into the ER or the emergency department to say, is there a crisis happening? Is this a serious situation or not? So that's what it's used for. So I call it a back of the napkin, very, very straightforward. Three things you need to calculate, right? So this is what it, this is what we have. Here's your cations, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. We're not using any of these. We're just using this one. And your anions, so here's your chloride and there's your bicarb. That's all we're using, even though there's other things in your blood. It's not part of the formula. So only using this, I just sort of simplified it and erased these other two. Commonly used, right? The sodium minus the chloride minus the bicarb or the CO2, simple calculation. But in this simple calculation, there's always gonna be a gap, right? An anion gap. So the sodium is always gonna be a huge number minus these two smaller numbers and the difference is always, always gonna be a gap. So there's nothing path pathological or sick about having an anion gap. What they'll say, is it an increased or high anion gap or is it a decreased or a low anion gap? And that's what you need to know. Remember, this is the $5 test we're gonna spend all this time on. All right, positive ions, cations, negative ions are anions, not to be confused with fireplace anions. Here's another picture of that. We're putting in some real numbers. Sodium 142, the CO2 or the bicarb. Remember the CO2 is on your labs. Bicarb is, why that is by the way, we just have CO2 as a number on your lab. Most of the CO2 in your body is actually in the form of bicarbonate. So we call it bicarb, but the CO2 is the thing we see on the lab. So we add these two together, we subtract it from the sodium, and what do we get? 42 minus 25 and 105. For this person, it's 12. Okay, does that mean anything? So what is the range? What's high? What's low? What does it mean? So low, so we now have the range. And I want you to remember this. It's like 10 to 16. Here's the range, 10 to 16. We're going to lock it in. It's a bit pretend uh, because the real world shifts it around a little bit. But for this sort of academic explanation, we're going to look at 10 to 16. And that's what you see in the medical books and everything else. But it varies in real life. Like everything else varies in real life. So low anion gap is below 10. High is above 16. What does that mean? Low means alkalosis. That means your pH is higher than 7.45. And acidosis, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, is it means it's lower. So it's kind of counterintuitive, but for those of us that learned about your pH scale in elementary school, I think it was, this is what we're talking about. The blood, your blood, the pH of your blood is always within, unless there's something really extraordinary going on, and we'll talk about that a little bit. It's always between 7.35 and 7.45. That means one tenth of one pH unit. So it's slightly acidic all the time. And if that shifts out of that box, out of that range, we have a problem. But there's so many mechanisms to lock that down that most people don't have a problem. Ever. So alkalosis versus acidosis, know that it's a very tight, tight, tight range, right? One tenth of one unit of pH, of one pH unit. That's all I want you to know. Alkalosis to the side, greater than 7.45. Acidosis to the other side, less than 7.35. Here's the bigger scale of the pH. I had to go through it from zero to 14. That's the scale. Zero is battery acid. Let's jump. 
five is black coffee, cow's milk is six, slightly acidic, neutral is seven, that's pure water, pure water as in distilled water, no minerals or anything in it, pure water, and human blood is on the slightly acidic side of that. And so when you get to eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14, all that's very alkaline. Here we have hand soap, laundry, detergent, uh, detergent ammonia, liquid bleach, sodium hydroxide, lye. So what they actually call this is metabolic. So they call it metabolic acidosis. They don't say, hey, your blood is acidosis. It's metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis. We're over here. We're going to be talking about this today. They get some of the conditions and so break it down very simply. So you walk away and I got it. I got it. I got it. Uh, alkalosis is far more rare. And the most common reason for alkalosis, meaning less than 10, is lab error. So get it done again. Ask them to do it again. For your $5, ask them to do it again. After that, if you have the comp panel, you're going to have albumin on it and check to see if that's low. Uh, the last is I had a brother who died from multiple myeloma, so he learned about this for sure. Uh, you have a lot of antibodies that clog up your blood and they're they more alkaline. They're proteins. Alkalosis, metabolic or acidosis. Life is good between in that one-tenth range and that one-tenth from 7.35 to 7.45. That's it. That range. Life is good. So what we're going to look at, there's really, in my view, only three reasons. I'm going to stretch them out a little bit. So we have diabetic ketoacidosis. And that was the reason this doctor said, stop keto, stop keto. Your, your anion gap is too big. Your anion gas, uh, gap is increased. Stop keto. He was worried about, he or she was worried about, this person's doctor was worried about diabetic ketoacidosis. And you're going to know what the difference is easily. Or fasting, you're also going to have a elevated increased anion gap. Ketogenic diets, you're going to have an elevated increased anion gap while you transition from your high carb diet to your low carb diet. And uh, lactic acidosis, which you get from exercise, we'll explore that. If you're, if one is an alcoholic, they are in constant uh, ketoacidosis. That's a pretty much a pathological situation, right? And they've self-induced a thiamine deficiency in both of these contribute to the ketoacidosis. There's various toxicities with this. I'm not gonna even gonna mention it. I used to have it, had it listed all out there, not worth going into it. I want you to focus on this because this is 99.9% .9 of all the reasons uh, a doctor will be concerned about an elevated anion gap. So the summary points here are there are three main reasons for elevated anion gap, otherwise known as metabolic acidosis. Diabetic ketoacidosis, big word in a very dangerous situation. Ketoacidosis from fasting or ketogenic diets. And lactic acidosis from exercise. Think uh, HIT, we'll get into that. EPOC, which is an oxygen debt, HIT, HIIT, intense aerobic. So our, it's intensity. We've got the word intensity. So the main reason why lactic acidosis is created usually is from intense exercise, not from chronic disease states. Think high intensity training or mine. What we do is uh, weight resistance, high intensity or slow, high intensity training with weights, which you'll see in a second. Uh, and EPOC, which is excess post exercise oxygen consumption. You can actually measure that and there's a whole field and so on and so forth, but they call it EPOC. Basically it's an oxygen debt. If you can think of yourself, whether it's coming up the stairs or whether it's running around the block or wherever level of activity you have, when you have to catch your breath, it's because you now relative to your state of condition have created an EPOC. You owe oxygen back to yourself. Okay. We'll get into some details. However, the more serious conditions are liver failure, cancer, low blood sugar, hypoglycemia on a chronic state and alcohol use disorder, which I've kind of mentioned already. So this is me when we go to the gym. This is every Monday and Friday and we go Wednesday as well, but we don't do HIT. So I'm wearing a Freestyle Libra here, which is a continual glucose monitor. And why I do that, and this is the, because it prints it out, I get to have a, see what my glucose did, because I pushed it so hard, which I'm supposed to do, and Judy does too, you're going to see a spike, a glucose spike happening in my readout. So it's all very flat, flat and boring, as I would say. But then there's suddenly a spike, wow, from the HIT session. It doesn't happen exactly, it happens a little bit afterwards. So the session was probably here in terms of time, but it's a payback, remember? So this degree of intensity will create lactic acidosis. If, I, if it wasn't very intense, I wouldn't have that. Why do glucose spikes happen during intense exercise? The three most common reasons are lactic acid. Gluconeogenesis converts lactic acid into glucose. We'll get into lactic, lactate in a second. Adrenaline. Adrenaline is the fight or flight. Somebody's after me. 
So you have to push so hard that you induce HIT the way we do it, the way we've been taught to do it, you have to push so hard, you induce a fight or flight response. So that's the second thing. Now we have adrenaline or epinephrine, the same word. So adrenaline comes from the adrenal glands, of course, goes to the pancreas to initiate glucagon. Glucagon gets released from pancreas and goes to the liver, and that's where glycogen gets broken down. Okay, so part of the fight or flight response releases stored glucose in the form of glycogen. The third thing is fasted exercise. Fasting in general, but fasting exercise. Exercising on an empty stomach, especially just after waking up, can amplify the dawn effect. So the dawn effect is about five o'clock, wherever you are, 5 a.m. I should say, 5 a.m. It can vary depending on your schedule, but for most people it's right around five o'clock in the morning, about an hour before they wake up. We actually wake up at quarter after four, hour before they wake up. And if you go fast and you go work out, suddenly you're getting even a bigger glucose spike. Pretty interesting, huh? So the fact that it's, it's actually called a lactate threshold, what does that mean, lactate threshold? You could actually measure it in your blood if you wanted to, but obviously we don't. We just look at the glucose, and so this shows that that did happen. But lactate in your bloodstream is an indication of intense exercise. So the intensity, notice at the bottom, this isn't time, intensity drives the rate of increase. So the more intense it gets, so this is very really intense, this is somebody sprinting or really pushing a lot of weight. And so it goes straight up. Down here, not so intense at all. So once you cross the line of which you don't have enough oxygen to feed your mitochondria, et cetera, et cetera, you are going to be into, you've crossed into the lactate threshold. You are going to be into epoch. Okay, here's another way of looking at it. lactate response to a 60 seconds all out maximum exercise. Peak values are typically observed three to eight minutes post exercise. So it's after the fact, right? Really pushed, really. So it's blood lactate measurements, really pretty interesting. That came out in 2007. It's now pretty established in looking at it that way. So one's intensity, and then it's a delayed time, just like you saw on the glucose spike for my CGM. So the thing about lactate, it's not a problem. It's, it used to be like, what's well, the burn? It's a, it's a waste product from working out. No, in itself is its own neurotransmitter in a way. It helps with heart, it helps with brain, brain-derived neurotropic factor. I'm not gonna go into that, but there's so many things that it helps that lactate itself helps. So that lactate threshold, having more lactate, really is like a body-wide spa, if you will. Okay, breathing and so on and so forth. Uh, gluconeogenesis, of course. So it most definitely is a good thing. So to say that lactic acidosis is a problem, it's going to throw off your anion gap, but it's a transitionary problem. It's going to fade. It's going to be for a couple hours and to some degree for the next day or two, depending on how hard you push yourself. But it passes. It's not a chronic condition. It's a temporary that you got from acute exercise. That's the point that I want to make. And most doctors don't know this. Remember, I said it's a back of the napkin calculation to find out, do we have a serious problem here? Keto, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis or not? And most doctors don't know about a ketogenic diet or that in fact it would affect anything. How do I measure a ketone? It's not their thing to look at. So let's look more closely. But all of these conditions have a high ion gap. They all have a, a metabolic acidotic anion gap, but they're very different. Diabetic ketoacidosis has high glucose, high insulin, High ketones, very easy to measure for anybody, certainly a doctor. Fasting will have low glucose. It will be high, then low glucose, depending where you are in the fast, and we'll go into that in a second. It will have low insulin, and it will have high ketones. Ketogenic diets, for that first month or six weeks, you're gonna transition, and initially you're gonna have pretty high ketones in your urine, then you're not gonna see it there, but you'll see it in your blood, and you'll finally level out to some sort of low level of, of uh, ketones. But the ketogenic diet will have low glucose, low insulin, and high ketones. Both of these create ketosis production of ketones for energy. So you're not using glucose as much. You're always using some glucose, by the way, but you're not using glucose as much. That's the big difference. Here's the fasting part. This comes way back from George Cahill's in 1975. He wrote a paper. He was up at MIT, I believe, or Harvard, in Boston, in the five phases of fasting. So the first, and this is what I want to, to paint out here. So the first stage and second stage of fasting is this. You've stopped eating, right? So as you stopped eating, you're still burning your food. Eventually, all the carbs you've eaten are gone. But in that first, I've stopped eating, first four hours or so, you're still deriving glucose from the food you ate. Eventually, get, that gets to zero. And then you start breaking down the glycogen from your liver and in your muscles. There's only so much glycogen in your body. So this, these are, this is glucose levels, right? So your glucose is falling a little bit, but it doesn't go to zero 
Then it comes up and it stays fairly level through as you go through your glycogen. Now your glycogen starts to be depleted. Now your liver has to make glucose right from the beginning. So it's gluconeogenesis. And so that rises and eventually that falls and it gets lower. So as your fast gets into two and he went out for uh, plus a month with his work, you'll see that your glucose does fall, never disappears, but your uh, ketones do increase. So stage one is the feeding. Stage two is post-absorption phase. You're, you're getting into the glycogen burning. Stage three is a gluco, gluconeogenesis primarily. And stage five is you're in ketosis. You're primarily burning ketones and some glucose. That's important to know because your anion gap is going to be high through the initial stages, through the whole fast. Okay, so this is where ketone meters come in. There's plenty of ketone meters, but back when we got started, Keto Mojo, I still think it's the best, really helpful, but measure your ketone. So that is a finger prick. It's not a urine meter, it's a finger prick. And this gets you to tell you, you know, this is where it's very easy to say, my ketones have come up. Why have your ketones come up? Because either you're fasting or you've dropped your carbs. So here's a paper that I think was, and now there's a number of papers like this, but this was sort of a wake up call to ER docs, emergency room doctors, or e emergency department doctors. So it's diet induced ketoacidosis in a non-diabetic. They would never think of that before. What, there's ketoacidosis in a non-diabetic? They would assume in the ER context that all ketoacidosis is diabetic ketoacidosis. It's an emergency. So if somebody comes in who's an emergency, and they didn't have high glucose, they didn't have high insulin, they go, what the heck is this? This is finally saying, hey, well, you know, there's this other condition out there, you might want to put it on your list. So the anion gap metabolic acidosis is a common disorder seen in the emergency department. The differential can include toxicological, renal, endocrine, infectious, and cardiogenic disorders, of course. Ketosis, however, is one of the rare causes of metabolic acidosis seen by emergency physicians in developed nations. Conclusion to this is, although rarely included in the differential diagnosis, you know, your list of things you have to think about, they just assume it's diabetic ketoacidosis is an emergency, you know. The diet-induced ketosis should be included by the emergency physician when faced with a patient who recently changed their eating patterns. So let them know, wait a minute, I just started keto, right? So back to the story of this doctor, this person, they didn't have enough information to know that there's a larger context. They thought, you know, they had, a na they had a hammer, so everything's a nail. Yep, oh, diabetic ketoacidosis. Did they take, for instance, right here, we're gonna look at, you gotta know this, diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA, is characterized by, very simple, high glucose, over 250, over 250, over 250 for mild, moderate, and severe. Okay, and here's the, up here, over 250, your CO2, by a carb, is less than 18. It gets to be less and less. Watch this, CO2, 15 to 18 for mild, 10 to 15, it's going down for moderate. For severe, it's less than 10. So your CO2 falls away. Ketones, present, present, and very high for severe. What I need to show you is how popular and how scientific the ketogenic diet has gone in the last 10 years. So when people say I'm in the ketogenic diet, it's not a fad diet. It's been around for well over 100 years. It started with Russell, Russell Wilder in 1923 and then Dr. Pennington in 25 to really formalize it for pediatric uh, epilepsy. I've talked a lot about that in past videos and in podcasts and so on and so forth. But I want to show you, despite all that, look at the research that's happened. So this is from a site of International Neurological Ketogenic Society. And we're gonna go through a few things to, I'm gonna show you how flooded and how popular and how cutting edge this is, far from a fad diet. This is all the studies, publications on a ketogenic diet by year. Look at that. Now you're up to 600 and this was uh, 2020. So it's a couple of years old. Uh, it's just amazing. Okay, now we're gonna have research papers just in, just for 2023. It's gotta be a thousand. Yeah, uh, these are, pick one, implications of nutrition on the prevention and improvement of age-related sarcopenia. What does that have to do with a ketogenic diet? Amazing. There are probably over a thousand. It goes on and on and on. I'm just scanning through to so this is far from a fad diet. This is very serious. This is used for neurological conditions. It's used for weight loss. It's used for sarcopenia. It's used for uh, dementia. It's phenomenal what they're used doing now. Here's low carb, uh, low calorie ketogenic diet, potential applications of treatment of polycystic syndrome, of course, PCOS. On and on it goes, but, and that's just August. So 
there's many more. I just thought that little flash by saying, this is a very big deal. So for, for doctors not to know about the ketogenic diet, that should be an alarm to you that, wait a minute, maybe my doctor is not at the cutting edge, or maybe he's like a mile away from the cutting edge. I need to at least involve yourself in the conversation. Don't take everything he or she sh says for gospel, but encourage a conversation, a dialogue between you two and ask uh, questions, participate. Don't do what this person did and said, he just said it was, uh, it was too high ion gap. That's not sufficient enough. So, you know, when I asked, yeah, what was your glucose? No, he didn't know his glucose. He didn't know his insulin. You have to participate. It's not all on the doctor. You have to participate. Okay, so that brings us to the question of what is ketoacidosis anyway? It's a big word, very big word. Probably one of the biggest words I know. It happens for two reasons. From uncontrolled diabetes, aka diabetic ketoacidosis, and that's high glucose, high ketones, high insulin, and it's a very dangerous situation. It is life or death. People die usually within a day or two, certainly within a week, if this is uncontrolled and not changed. So the other is beneficial, the opposite. Okay, natural ketosis due to a low carb diet, fascinating, otherwise known as the ketogenic diet, normal glucose, moderate ketones, normal insulin, insulin and very beneficial. Big distinction. In essence, what we're saying is, it's the combination of high glucose, high insulin with high ketones that is the definition of diabetic ketoacidosis versus normal glucose, normal insulin, and moderate ketones equals ketoacidosis. Again, back to this, 10 to 16, that's the frame. Remember, 10 to 16, above 16, acidosis, below, alkalosis. Very tight range, only one-tenth of 1%. One Boom. Okay, three examples. 52-year-old man, high stress. 65-year-old woman on an ACE inhibitor. 67-year-old man, low carb, diet for four years. And so we've went through, I'm not gonna go through everything. This, we're gonna come back to this man on the top because he had a very high potassium, which I've just said, hey, we're not using in this formula. So we're just gonna ignore that. Well, that was so critical with this particular person that the lab called me and said, hey, this is a semi-emergency. You better check into what's going on with this guy. So we will come back to him. But right now, on these anion gaps, 18, 19, and 14, you can say, well, what? these two are you know, higher than the range. Should I be worried about that? We'll look into it later. I would say generally no and retake it, and that's why you track things to know where you are. But these are not high numbers. High or high, high is high. So what does this mean anyway? And someone who took their anion gap over three years, Look at this, over three years, that's pretty insightful, don't you think? So we have the sodium, not using the potassium, the chloride and the carbon dioxide. The, their anion gap was seven, nine, and seven, average of eight. Are they in trouble? I don't know this person. I would, I would definitely ask questions about what else is going on because that's consistently low. This is right up, but it's not way low, 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 it's, but it's not like there's a lot of points to get way low, 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 but it's consistently under. So I would definitely ask questions on that. Rabbit hole ahead, going deeper, going deeper. Okay, remember back to the process, we start with the people, their labs, put it into a spreadsheet, and then from there we get on scatter plots so we can look at things a little more intimately, a little more deeply, and see some special relationships. So now we're gonna look at ion gap over age, right? So here's age from the people I've worked with from 15 to 80, and what do we see? All right, there's a nice little graph there, anion gap versus age. So here's the range, we've tilted it. Here's your 10 to 16, right? Here's the, the healthy range, we're staying within that, 10 to 16. So higher, it looks like if, of the older people I've worked with, they're just starting to pop out and getting a little bit too acidic. But the younger people were kind of alkaline. But for most, in fact, there was kind of a plateau between what, age 30 to 65. So about 35 years is kind of a non-event. But wait, the question becomes, of the three, Ions, sodium, chloride, bicarb, CO2, used to calculate the anion gap, which one changes the most? Huh, as the anion gap gets higher, starts to move out, get more acidic, right? Over 16, more acidic. And the answer is, remember we're doing this? We're subtracting these from sodium, so we're always having that gap? Okay, the answer is CO2, bicarb. That's why it was stated when we were talking about diabetic ketoacidosis, that as the CO2 got lower and lower and lower, their situation was progressively more severe. So sodium, carbon dioxide, and chloride, the three, the three, this is the cation, so the three ions we're looking at. These are the two anions, this is the cation. This is the range, this is just midpoint. So for the entire range that we looked at per age, the anion gap, this is over um, 
sodium here and anion gap on the bottom. It stays within the range. It doesn't go out of the range. I'm gonna jump over here and say the chloride, here's the here's midpoint to the range so that it's, it's comfortably between 98 and 110. So 98 is down here, 110 is way up here. It's comfortably always within the range. But the CO2, the carbon dioxide, no, it doesn't as your anion gap gets higher and higher. Remember, 10 to 16? As it gets over 16, right at that number, at 16, it drops out and gets too low. So CO2, bicarb, gets lower and lower and lower the more dangerous the situation becomes. Okay, diabetic ketoacidosis, characterized again by, I've already did this before, over, 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 high glucose, the CO2 decreases, less than 10. Let me just go back, less than 10, less than 10. All right, here we're looking at it even more specifically. So anion gap 10 to 16 is right here, and we're having, this is your measure of CO2 is right here. So they're saying the CO2 less than 10, that's a very deep line, that's way off the graph. Let me go back one. So less than 10, CO2 would be here, less than 10 would be way off the graph. That's how CO2 is kind of the independent variable of how important bicarbs are to us maintaining that one tenth of one pH unit. Okay, so this is that spreadsheet of all the different labs are going back and forth that we're gonna use some of these for the, those scatter plots that I've done. So here's the anion gap with sodium only and sodium potassium. And you get to go down and say, so where are these numbers? When you look at at least this page that we're looking at right now on this column specifically, you go, all right, remember we said 10 to 16? Here we have, what's that, 10 people that are under 10. And how many over 16? We have four or five people over 16. In reality, it's not that tight, you know, so I'm not that worried about that. I would look at 19, see what else is going on with these particular, that, that person's labs. And then with the people that are low, I would look at the other labs to find out if they're liver and so on and so forth. But generally those rifts are not that big. Those divergence from the norm are not that big, but that's how you would do it. So these are the, where, where the real numbers show up. Okay, now let's add another layer of data to make this even more interesting to the anion gap results we've already looked at. We're gonna look at glucose and insulin. So I'm gonna say, here's the cost of those tests. There's 450 for a glucose test and insulin's $13, same thing, plus phlebotomy fee. I just wanted to show you these are, these are cheap tests. These are very valuable and very worthwhile spending the money and getting these tests on yourself. Here's what we're looking at now. So from my spreadsheet, we're looking at HOMA IR, which is how we calculate insulin resistance. So here's the glucose and the insulin. I'm gonna show you about that. So review, what is insulin resistance in lab? First of all, you need a fasting glucose, you need a fasting insulin, and then you can calculate it and you can do it one of two ways. You can do it yourself if you want to. And depending if you're a part of the metric system in Europe and Canada, or you're in the United States, there's two different formulas, or you can just go to the a link I'm gonna show you in a second. So the HOMA IR stands for homeostasis, model of assessment of insulin resistance. I'm just gonna call it IR or HOMA IR. So those are the two formulas. Interesting, it's been around for a while. This is the definitive way when people say insulin resistance, it's based on their HOMA IR. It's not like, well, I don't know, I'm not feeling good today. I think I'm insulin resistant. No, it's, it's, it's a lab test analysis. So if you're over 1.4, it's considered insulin resistant. Here's where you also can go to the link and you can plug in, you can change your or if in Europe or wherever, you can change your units right there and it all works out. So it's not locked in stone. You can change the units, you can do it by hand, do whatever you wanna do. So now I did a screenshot of, just to make it visible, if I did everybody, it wouldn't be legible, so what's the point, right? So this is insulin resistance versus not insulin resistance. So by, let's look, HOMA IR, right? Here's HOMA IR. Everything over here has to be under 1.4. Everything over here has to be over 1.4. That's true. What else does it correlate? Here's the glucose and here's the insulin. I find it easier to read horizontally than to read vertically. So what I have to do is actually transpose these to a vertical for me to do the scatter plots. But to read these and discuss it, I like the horizontal. All right, HOMA IR, glucose, and insulin. You're going to see that, okay, what's the HOMA IR? And you look at their, their glucose, I then sorted by glucose. You know, lower within each group. They go, all right, that's pretty normal. The one's kind of a little high getting, you know, but yet they're still not insulin resistance. What's their insulin level like? 0.2, the highest is 5.9. That's high-ish, but it's not terribly high. Now let's go over to the insulin resistant group and you'll see, well, they're all over 1.5, right? All over 1.4. And their insulin is certainly higher, but we had some normal insulin, uh, normal glucose in there. And then some outrageously high glucose levels. These are fasting glucose levels, remember, not random. And then here's the insulin. Some of the insulin is insanely high, 52, 30, 20, 20, yeah. So it's the insulin that really makes the whole deal. So then you can look at other 
correlations and so on. But when you when your eye goes to all right, what other correlations it, you know are associated with home IR? It's really hard to see it on a spreadsheet that way. I thought it was a breakthrough uh, about ten years ago when I started doing this, but once I learned about scatter plots like this, uh, this helped a lot. So this is simply glucose to insulin. So I took that that row, but of, of more data, and I threw it out there. So this is everybody insulin resistant and non insulin resistant in one group. What does it look like? Well, what it shows is kind of like well, all right, as the glucose goes up. This is a glucose number over here. As the glucose goes up, of course, the insulin is going to go up. So I didn't learn anything. That makes sense to me. Just wait, just wait. So for the range, when we talk about insulin, I've seen the range extended twice in the last five years. So my range is two to five. That's what I think is a good range. The conventional range that you'll see on the lab test is two to 25 or 24.9. And the glucose range has not changed. That's 65 to 99. Now divide that group of all into two groups, right? The non-insulin resistance and the insulin resistance based on their HOMA IR. What do we see? They're different graphs. First of all, that's the graph I just showed you exactly, shrunk down a little bit. That looks kind of like the insulin resistant group, pretty much almost identical, right? But when we call out those who are not insulin resistant under 1.4, what do we see? Really interesting. One is their glucose, their insulin down here, insulin on the bottom of all of these, and glucose on the left side. We see the insulin is a lot lower, and we see the, the glucose peaks at 90. So you can see some of these people had glucose in the 70s, 80s, and peaked at 90. So of course, 70s and 80s. And then as their insulin went up, their glucose came down. You say, well, of course, that's how it's supposed to be. Yeah, that's right. That's how it's supposed to be. Here, their, glu their insulin is going up, but their glucose is not coming down. So this is the healthy status. This is how your body does work. This is textbook, medical, lab rat analysis. Everything's fine. These are healthy people. And it's tightly, tightly controlled, right? Non-insulin resistance versus insulin resistance. Here is, you know, they, the insulin becomes less and less effective as time goes on. They need to throw more insulin in there to control it, but it's, they're losing the ability to control their glucose levels. Okay, again, we're looking at just blew it up a little bit. Here's the non-insulin resistant people. It, their glucose peaked at 90. Their insulin did go as high. Some people did go as high. I guess that's about eight or so. But as their insulin went up, their glucose came down. How it's supposed to go. And so now I put that, I shrunk that down to sort of say, well, here's a little area of the, you know, in the whole range here. So you can see their glucose comes down as their insulin goes up. But for the IR, insulin resistant people, their glucose continues to go up higher and higher and higher, even though the insulin is getting to be 15, 30, 45, 60. So the insulin becomes progressively less effective with increasing insulin resistance. That's the point. Very effective, very tightly controlled, less effective. It's now starting to lose control. And that's starting to cause a lot of other problems. We're going to see it in the anion gap among others, but it's cardiovascular, it's immunological, and so on. It's neurological. Okay, so the ideal area of glucose and insulin is really right there per me you know, for most people, right around 3.5. So between two and a half to five, that's the range. And you look at glucose, which is, here's the, my ideal range is 70 to 90. So that's where I think is health right there. When people ask, what's the ideal range? So that means, I'll say it out loud, the glucose here, from my view, is between 75 and 90 for glucose, fasting glucose, and your insulin is between two and a half and five. Boom, that would put you right dead center. Okay, notice there's a big difference between the insulin resistance people and the non-insulin resistance people and their anion gap. Let's look at this. Insulin resistance people had that, what I showed you before, from age, this is age in the bottom, 15 to 80, and we have the anion gap going up at the side and left side. But look at the range from seven to 17, a range of 10 over age of 15 to 80. But for the non-insulin resistant people, the range is barely two. 15, 14, maybe 16, two or three for an entire lifetime. So it's very tightly controlled. So it's an entirely different graph when you separate it by insulin resistance. So summary point, if your anion gap is chronically high, check your insulin resistance status, i.e. the HOMA IR under 1.5 or over 1.5, depending on your what sort of a problem. So the conclusion to all of this is what to take from this video is know the basic labs about yourself, the ones we've gone over today. That's under $20 spending. Unless you're a diabetic or think you might be, having an elevated anion gap might well be a good thing. It might be post-exercise. It might be a transitioning into the ketogenic diet or light carb. Signaling that you are in ketosis or had an intense workout 
and will increase your IGF. More on that next time. So if this is something that you're interested in, that is a topic that I obviously go deeper in, in terms of labs, in terms of how to do it, in terms of why you would want to do it, various topics, as you've seen that I've done in the past, then please let me know below in a comment. Till then.